Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Time for Spring Cleaning, How to Clean Up Your Data. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of our event today. And with me are Dan Elam from Contoral and Richard Hogg from IBM. And IBM is the underwriter of today's webinar. And we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. And uh, before we get started, just want to offer you a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. Uh, by joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience. So just feel free to open and close or resize the different windows. And also across the bottom of your screen is a list of all of the widgets that are available to you. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right side of your screen. And uh, I've also placed in there a number of additional documents and links uh, to help you learn more about today's topic. So please take advantage of all that we've placed in there for you today and, and download all of that information. Feel free to ask questions throughout the hour using the Q&A feature. We will hold these questions until the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. And this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to AIM.org's Webinars on Demand Library in just a few days. I'd like to take this opportunity right now to introduce our speakers today. Um, Dan Elam is one of the industry's best known consultants for content management and information governance. He is an AIM Fellow and has served the association in numerous capacities, including as U.S. technical expert to the International Standards Organization. Dan has worked on over $4 billion of information governance programs, including some of the largest commercial and government projects in the world. He's held leadership positions with iMERGE, IQ Group, and Gimmel. He currently serves as Vice President with Contoral, leading independent information governance consulting firm, where he leads teams to help customers develop strategies and policies. And we also have with us Richard Hogg, and he's IBM's Global Information Governance Solutions Leader. And Richard consults with clients, leading them through improved information and e-discovery economics towards defensible disposal. With 20 years of experience, he leads the deployment of some of the largest ERM solutions worldwide. Richard is a frequent speaker on information governance, e-discovery, and records management at the international and regional conferences annually. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Dan Elam to begin discussing about how to clean up your data. Dan? Great. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, unfortunately, anytime we get into the the legal side, I have to give the standard disclaimer that we're not giving legal advice today. Uh, we're just giving information about legal issues, and so I think we've covered the, the key issues for the lawyers there. So here's the problem. So we've become a, a nation of digital pack rats. Um, we, we grow information at an incredible rate. Um, right now, the, the amount of information that we have is increasing at astronomical levels. If there's one thing that we've learned, it's that technology allows us to produce more and more information. Um, that's not always useful for us, but it certainly creates a big problem. And particularly in the U.S., we have an issue with e-discovery issues, and that's starting to expand in other areas where it may not necessarily be a legal issue, it might be a regulatory issue, a privacy issue, but we're finding that the need to be able to access this information is growing at a pretty astounding rate. So, so just in the U.S., one in three companies is involved in a single matter that has more than a two and a half terabytes, and that has for the last three years been increasing by 25% per year. So almost everyone is trying to understand how do we manage this vast amount of information and, and get a handle on it, both because we want to reduce costs, but also because we want to be able to satisfy our legal and regulatory uh, requirements. So there basically are three key steps that we're going to cover fairly quickly today. We have the, the concept of mapping our information and then organizing it into the different uh, types and repositories that we want to deal with, and then how do we migrate our old information into our new environment. So on the mapping side, there are basically three key steps, and they actually start from the bottom up. So we have a data catalog. The data catalog feeds into a system inventory, which is a list of the systems that we have, and an ESI map. And I'm going to talk briefly about each one of these. So the data catalog is your first high-level view of where you have information. So the idea is that you're trying to take a look at all of the places that you store information. Now, a common problem is that organizations forget that they have information in the cloud, and they typically will do their data catalog to focus only on those systems that they administer inside their organization. 
You also have issues of, of content that might be stored with third parties. These might be lawyers that do things on your behalf. If you're a financial services firm, you might have um, original records that are actually stored with a, a, a trust organization. You might be involved on the building side where your architects or engineers will actually have copies of your as-built drawings or, or certain specifications about your building or equipment or something. So it's important that you remember that you have to look for where the sources of information are and not just be focused on what you have sitting in the glass cottage in the organization. Now, eventually all of this information is going to be integrated into the system inventory, but it, this is a good place that you can get a handle on what you have and start thinking about the information, but you'll also use it to identify integration points for new systems. As you implement new systems or you buy systems, you know, all of the information typically is tied to, to something else today. And so it's good to know what those systems are and where you have access or where you have information stored. Okay, so the system inventory is that detailed master list. And you're also trying to get details on what information is, is in those systems. Ideally, you would get the actual metadata fields for the, the key things so you know what you can search and find, but that's not always practical. So at the very least, get concepts of information, it's like this is HR information or this is HR information um, about active employees or active employees just in North America. Um, you want to try and be as discreet as you can, but recognizing that that's not always possible. The reason why you want to be discreet here is because later on you're going to use this in certain legal issues, and so it's, it's real important that you try and get that level of granularity early. You also don't want to forget about the systems that you're going to sunset. Uh, almost every organization has a plan to get rid of older systems. Rationalization, particularly for ECM platforms, is a big deal today as organizations try and collapse the number of vendors and products that they have into just a handful or, or a single uh, platform. And so there's a lot of emphasis on, on trying to pay attention to those systems that we're going to get rid of. And in some cases, you know, it's easy to lose sight of those systems because, uh, you know, the IT organizations typically are more focused on what do we have to do to get new systems in, what do we have to do to keep systems up and running, and not necessarily about that old data in those decommissioned systems. Again, you know, back to the whole issue of the third parties and the cloud information is a big deal. So just because you don't manage it doesn't mean that it doesn't have your records. So the ESI map is something that's very specific. There's something called Rule 26F, which is part of the uh, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And, and basically, when there's a lawsuit, um, the courts recognize that not all information is equal in terms of how hard it is to get. And we have vast amounts of information, and it's not cost-effective to, to go through and look at all of that. So what they allow for is something called a meet and confer, which is where the attorneys basically can sit down and say, okay, here's what we want to search, and here's what we're looking for. Um, and then the other side gets to say, okay, um, here's where our information is. It's easier to get this information in some places. It's harder to get this information in others. And there's a sort of negotiation back and forth subject to a judge uh, approving it that basically says, okay, uh, these are the search terms that we're going to use. Here's what we're going to, to look for uh, in the systems that we're actually going to query against. Now, the whole idea behind the ESI map is expanded to be more than just legal today. What we're finding is that regulators uh, are sort of using that same concept. So if you're in a, heavy, if you're in a heavily regulated environment, uh, maybe financial services or pharmaceutical, uh, this is something that's pretty important and something that you should expect to be the basis for dealing with your, with your regulators. The other thing that an ESI map does is it identifies the custodians of information. So who owns it, who's responsible. Uh, in some cases, there are certain custodians that actually have different um, legal uh, needs. But these are also the people that would typically be involved in a legal hold or, um, you know, would be ones that you would have to make sure that you had done a special search for to, to find all that. And remember, it's not just the stuff that's stored on a file share. It's all of the information. So that can be a USB drive. It can be their phones. If you use your personal phone for business, it can include that. So it really is uh, very comprehensive and it can have pretty dramatic uh, legal uh, implications. Now, ESI maps are starting to evolve even more 
when we start factoring in things like privacy and jurisdiction, particularly if you're a multinational organization where I have information that's stored maybe in a different country or maybe it's even stored in a different state where there are rules about information uh, crossing those geographic boundaries. You also have issues for things you know, like that privacy or personal um, information, particularly health records, that uh, you know, have to be protected differently and have to be managed through that whole process as well. So once you figure out sort of where your content is, the first thing to do is start taking a look at how you're going to organize it. And we generally break this into seven different areas. You have structured content, which are going to be your traditional databases and most legacy applications. So, you know, the things that are running off of a database. You've got semi-structured. These are going to be um, unstructured uh, content that has some structured information with it, so i.e. A, a Word file that has a database. All of your ECM systems are going to, to be an example of semi-structure. Some SharePoint implementations will have that, but it sort of depends on whether you implement it out of the box. A lot of the SharePoint implementations are just bad replacements for, for file shares, and they don't have a whole lot of metadata information that we can use for organization and records management downstream. So, so the better systems will look more like an ECM system or maybe even be tied to an ECM system. So um, most of the time you'll put semi-structured in um, uh, to include some of the more advanced SharePoint, but not all of them. Then the unstructured ones will be our classic file shares, um, and it will also be any out-of-the-box SharePoint implementations. We break messaging out separately. That will be email and chat messages, and that's because we need to manage that information. We also typically have different search tools that we're going to use against those, um, and it, it's both easier in some respects and harder in others to be able to classify records. And a lot of organizations make mistakes in how they deal with the messaging. So by keeping in mind that it's a different type of content, we can apply different uh, technology sets against it. We'll also have video and audio, all of the voicemails that you have. If you have um, videos that you use for uh, customer presentations or things that also would be uh, subject to legal or regulatory issues, those would be things that you manage. Obviously, again, different types of search tools that we use and other things that we, that we would use to manage that information. We'll have our backup information, all of this information going to tape or virtual libraries. Um, Again, different types of tools, different ways to manage and, you know, typically um, integrated retention schedules for how we're going to manage the information. But it's very, very difficult to go through and manage that information. So we want to treat that differently and be aware of it. And last but not least, we have all of our paper. The paper would include both what we have internally as well as what we have stored externally with vendors like an Iron Mountain or Recall or similar vendors. Okay, so once we've sort of figured out what are our different types in terms of organization, we want to figure out how we migrate it. And this is something that's, that's critically important. The cost of migrating the data can often equal or exceed the cost of buying an entire new system. So it's very important that we try and get a handle on it, and we also want to get rid of as much uh, what we call ROT, redundant, obsolete, and trivial information, as possible so that we're not paying to convert and manage information that we don't need to have. So, so we have all of this information that's sort of jumbled by different content types, and we want to be able to provide as much structure to it as possible. So all of those file shares that we know nothing about except the directory that they're sitting in, ideally we would put those into some sort of you know, ECM type platform that we'd have some information about it. We also need to make sure that we're managing it appropriately, and there are some legal implications that we're not going to have time to go through today, but, but you have a certain fiduciary responsibility for how you handle records. And so the courts actually give you a lot of lenience in this regard in that you can more often than not delete things as long as you have a reasonable business case, and it can be fairly generic. So as long as you show that you have a a process for managing appropriately, you end up with what we call defensible disposition, and that's a big deal. That's what you're trying to get to as you go through any of this migration, making sure that you can defensively defend what you got rid of and why. Um, sometimes you'll be able to use simple um, uh, classification rules where you can take an entire library folder or doc types by date and be able to get rid of all that information. Uh, a little bit of work can go a long way to getting rid of a lot of information. However, once you start getting into really large repositories, 
you're really going to need some sort of auto classification tool. And that's because it just is not cost effective to be able to go through all of the information manually <clears throat> or even with the low end tools and be able to get rid of enough information or to classify it so that you can apply your records retention schedules and your other policies against the data. So when you look at the repositories, what you want to think about is, is how you're going to move the information and organize it. Now, right now, we typically have organizations where you'll have working documents, and then you'll try and figure out where you're going to, to put them, uh, maybe in an ECM platform, and then you'll have reference materials that you use later. So our working documents aren't necessarily records, but they become records. Our reference documents definitely aren't records, but they still have meaning, and users want to be able to maintain those and, and, and manage those and keep those. Um, but you still need to do it within the, the processes and procedures that you have. So understanding uh, all of those content types and how the employees are going to work with them is a big deal. And so as part of that, what, uh, what we recommend is something called a data placement strategy, which is where you'll do your mapping between your existing folders and repositories to figure out what the new to be environment is. So you're going to have a very clear picture that you can articulate to all the users. You want to collapse information into common repositories as much as possible because it'll make it easier both for users to find it, but it'll also make it easier for the classification routines and the records management policies to be able to work against the same amount of data. Um, you really want to do all of this with an idea that you're going to be simplifying your life on the records management side. Good records management programs today are very, very cost effective because they save money on storage and backup. And then if you do get into e-discovery issues, then your costs are dramatically reduced. So it really is a big deal. And with all of this, you want to make sure that you review your proposed uh, structures you know, with the users as a prototype. Let them see it. Let them take uh, a look at some of their existing documents and figure out how would they put it into the new environment so that you're set. Once you have those rules in place, then you can start using that information for your auto classification routines. And in some cases, you can even do some of the migration uh, manually. Now, the migration tools are a really big deal. So, and they all work at a high level sort of in the same way, but this is a case where the technology is not all created equally. And this is a big deal. So. Um, you want to make sure that the tools know how to do the rod analysis and then be able to, to migrate or move the data. And keep in mind that you still have to maintain some of the security privileges, or if you're going to break security, you want to make sure that you have a way to, to reintroduce it or capture it. Um, you know, if you're going from a file share and you're putting in an ECM system, you know, I might want document level security versus group level security or something. <clears throat> All of those things are things that you need to factor in when you're looking at migration tools. It seems real simple at the high end. And then once you have those, you still have the actual auto classification. And the tools are very, very good on the auto classification side. Some of the higher end tools can actually identify concepts. They can identify privacy or intellectual property so that you can manage that information differently and focus on both the record side and the security side. And then once you have your migration done, you can use those same tools to help with auto classification for the records so that you're putting them in the right buckets in the future. That can simplify things for the users. You'll end up with higher adoption rates, and it also is how records managers end up getting invited to the Christmas parties because now people like them as opposed to having to think that records management is just a pain for them. Um, now, a lot of the low-end tools can get rid of some of the rot, and this is where it gets a little bit difficult. If you do a demo, the low-end tools pretty much look like the same high-end tools, and there's a pretty dramatic difference in uh, price. I mean, literally, uh, you know, 100,000 times more expensive uh, for some of the products. So, um, And it would be tempting to say, oh, well, we'll just use a low-end product because it's so inexpensive. The problem is that only works against small data sets. When you get to these very large, complex data sets, data sets the, the enterprise class systems – really do a good job, and they have dramatically different uh, features and document understanding and different tools for all of that stuff. So so you have to be very careful. Just looking at the demo or the spec sheet, just because they check the box does not mean that they work the, the same way. So, And you'll have you know all kinds of issues um, for how they do both the rod analysis, the migration, and then any auto classification. So... Um, the, uh, the the bottom line, though, is that these migration tools really can result in some dramatic savings. Um, and also, almost any of the enterprise class tools 
um, with a little bit of customization will meet all of the legal defensible disposition uh, requirements. Now, obviously, your mileage will vary. You'll have to verify this with uh, with your corporate legal counsel. Um, but what we found is that the courts have been uh, very accepting of having something in place and an automated tool that may understand that this is a tough issue to handle, and they've given wide deference to, to using tools like this. So, And then finally, once you've got that tool, don't forget that you can use it in the future. You'll have done tuning. You'll have taught the, the classification tool information about your content and how you structure it, and that same information can be used later on to help continue to classify records after you've done the migration. So, so these tools really can be cost effective, and then they have long-term benefits down the road. So just in summary, there's sort of three steps that you have to focus on. You want to make sure that you map all your information, figure out how you're going to organize it, and then you're going to go through your migration. And if you do this correctly, you're going to reduce both your legal cost and your IT cost. You're not going to have as much information. You're not going to be backing up as much information. And then you're not going to be spending a fortune to look through it and manage it when it comes time to an actual legal issue. <clears throat> you do need to involve the users. Um, you know, when you use these systems, um, it's uh, it's an opportunity to have some process improvement. Now, if your organization doesn't do a lot of records management, they may resent some of that. So um, this is a way that you can make records management be easier for them because they're not having to think and, and do the same document level um, descriptions and, and classifications at a, at a really deep level. So, so it can be something that can yield tangible benefits, and if you do it correctly, you can end up with the users, you know, actually liking you as opposed to, you know, uh, sometimes it's worse than that when it comes to implementing some of these, uh, these other systems. Um, so the cost is a big deal, but really we're still focused on that defensible disposition. And last but not least, and I can't say this enough, especially when you're getting ready to hear um, about IBM and, and, and their technology, but these enterprise class tools may look the same in the demo, but they really are different when you apply them against large complex repositories. And so it's important that you do benchmarking and you make comparisons because um, there really is a dramatic difference uh, in what those tools will do. So, okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Richard Hogg. Uh, Richard handles the, the global information governance uh, uh, pieces for IBM. You can see him you know, all over the world for various things. And I know uh, I'm delighted to, to hear the new information that he has about what they're doing. So, Richard, I'm going to let you take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Dan, and welcome, everybody. Uh, well, let's continue the focus on cleaning up data and especially on unstructured data. Uh, unstructured often has the highest annual growth rates year on year and an awful lot of the risk and is often a focus, especially in North America, uh, where e-discovery would start. You've probably seen study after study uh, quote the various ratios of uh, the volume of all of your information that actually has or doesn't have a business value. Gartner here saying that uh, up to 45% of your unstructured data created just this year would actually have no business value in one year. So companies are sitting on a huge amount of data, uh, a huge volume, growing on average 40% year on year for unstructured, and is a large risk and consuming a lot of uh, uh, storage costs. Organizations tend to keep too much of this redundant obsolete and trivial information, uh, information that really shouldn't be consuming enterprise or corporate resources. Uh, a lot of this rot is straightforward to define for organizations. It can be as simple as your iTunes libraries and your vacation photographs you know, shouldn't be on the corporate file shares or uh, SharePoint or being backed up on the email archive. Uh, but also uh, temporary and scratch files that tend to build up on uh, any system. It's pretty straightforward nowadays to define the criteria and categories and types of this rot and rapidly find it. On average, this rot can be between 15 and 25 percent of your unstructured stuff, and you're able to drain the swamp very quickly within weeks or months being able to find that. Once you've identified and removed the rot, you can then move on and focus on the rest of the information uh, in your unstructured sources, commonly file shares, SharePoint, ECM repositories, production email, email archives, as well as ECM repositories as well, and move on and look at 
where do we have sensitive and critical information, such as PII and PCI and HCI, and define for your organization what is sensitive and critical, being able to remediate that, and then focus in on the rest of the dark data, uh, information that may be records in the wild but today are not well managed at all or re not even visible uh, on your records management radar. So key at an enterprise scale is to be able to use instrumentation technologies uh, that will let you act rapidly, again, within weeks or months, depending on the, the terabytes or petabytes of uh, unstructured data you have, and go through a defensible, repeatable, uh, volume-to-relevance methodology, which is a key to doing cleanup. Uh, where you're able to, with these modern enterprise scale tools, uh, look at all of your enterprise information, both in the online uh, production enterprise systems, again, file shares, SharePoint and email, but even down to where you allow users to store uh, content locally on their desktops and laptops. That can be another key uh, data source to focus on for data cleanup. So rapidly get to the facts of the data, drain and off the swamp and remove the rot, focus on the sensitive and critical information, find and remediate the records in the wild, and then the business value data that was left, kick it through a curation process based on negotiating around the actual facts of the data, not guessing or assuming with the end users of, do you need all this stuff or how much is really valuable? Always be able to focus on the facts of the information. And that's what these enterprise scale assessment and cleanup tools uh, give you the ability to do. So being able to assess in place is key as well because you don't want to move the problem somewhere else. And especially you don't want to alter any of the existing metadata, which are key facts to the uh, information. So gathering the relevant information, be able to index at enterprise scale. And often you would do this again through this volume to reference methodology, applying uh, and using and leveraging different filters to get to ever smaller slices of your enterprise information that you can then take action on remediation. Is this stuff we can immediately delete? Is this stuff we need to archive, still keep for a period, re-tier, deduplicate, compress, stuff that may be formal records we need to manage in our corporate record system, or stuff that we can leave for a, a short amount of time because it's just a general business value. Now, the common filters you would go through here would be first to do a, a metadata index very quickly, even at uh, the petabyte scale of uh, enterprise uh, unstructured data sources. And then taking a smaller set of information that you've metadata indexed, uh, you would then be able to do full text indexing on all the common uh, file types and sources where you can index in place. Again, you don't need to do full text indexing across all of your uh, unstructured data footprint. There'll be some information, especially when you look to find records in the wild, you can leverage auto classification tools. Today's modern enterprise scale auto classification technologies let you very quickly train it on examples of your retention schedule, no more defining rules, which are hard to maintain and immediately out of date, but give it real world examples of your uh, records, classes, or categories from your schedule. And it will continue to learn and refine those over time and let you actually find uh, very quickly records in the wild. So being able to do an assessment in place is key where you can avoid moving the problem somewhere else and potentially changing or, or altering the metadata information. Uh, you will probably have multiple data sources and many, many different file types. Uh, so when you're looking at instrumentation to be able to do assessment in place to help with legacy data cleanup, uh, check that you can leverage an open uh, architecture that is scalable to the enterprise level, petabytes of information. Once you've quickly uh, assessed and indexed, uh, doing a metadata index first, uh, you can get visualizations as shown here, which will start to reveal the facts of the data to you, and again, you can start to use these facts to hone and negotiate and accelerate 
uh, your discussions with the line of business and the end users as to what is critical information to you, how much of this information do we need to keep, uh, where should we keep it. Uh, simple facts shown can include, obviously, the uh, date, the frequency of access, the file types, especially if you've got a permitted or a banned file type list. Again, this can quickly help you identify the ROT candidates. Uh, the visualization shown here is giving us, quite literally, the view of all the unstructured data across the whole enterprise, all of it. So we're seeing file shares, we're seeing SharePoint, uh, even down to uh, Exchange servers and desktops and laptops. A single complete view on one page, very, very powerful to focus the, uh, the discussions and decisions. As we focus on the facts of the data and we can start to slice and dice and drill in, here we can see, for example, where do we have the oldest or least used data residing? And why do we have uh, you know, almost 70% of our uh, content on file shares uh, that is aged over five years old? Is that stuff we really should leave on the most expensive tiers of storage? They could be immediate candidates to put in an uh, archiving solution an archive to a lower, cheaper tier of storage, still accessible to the end users. We can preserve the context now with modern archiving systems so that even if we're moving your older and frequently accessed documents and files to an archive, we pr preserve your context using stubbing or shortcuts so that you can still get to where you think it is in your file share folder or your email uh, folder. But really, it's coming from the centralized, deduplicated, and compressed uh, uh, version that's in the archive. So we've got to the facts of the data. Uh, we can rapidly identify rot and drain the swamp uh, by, on average, 15 to 25 percent. Uh, next, we need to be able to find the sensitive and critical information to your business and remove this risk in that unstructured data, which often today is dark. You have no idea of the risk of the, uh, of the information across your unstructured sources. Uh, you'll have common definitions for your business in the industries and geographies you operate in for what is sensitive and critical for you. Most often, it's personally identifiable information, ever driven now by the focus on privacy or even privacy. Uh, payment card industry, where do you have uh, credit card and uh, banking information, and then highly confidential information, uh, including uh, uh, health uh, and uh, medical information as well. Uh, it's very straightforward to define in these enterprise assessment tools these uh, criteria, often through defining regular expressions uh, to get into techno talk for a moment. Uh, and again, very quickly, in weeks, you're able to find and remediate that particular slice of your enterprise pie, that is this sensitive and critical information. An example is a large energy company recently who was remediating the petabytes of file shares they had, and they were able to uh, remediate, uh, remove 17% of their stuff that was rot, but at the same time as assessing in place, indexing and getting to the facts of the data, they discovered they have 21 different types of uh, sensitive and critical information that was out there uh, representing risk to the organization, and they could move it to a more uh, secure managed GTM repository uh, and reduce their risk. So once we've reduced the, uh, uh, the risk, again, the visualizations in these enterprise tool scale tools can help you here. The visualization in this example is using a heat map to convey the scale uh, or volume of sensitive and critical information we have across all of that unstructured stuff we indexed at the start. Looking here for credit, credit card information, and redder is worse. Uh, the redder the heat map is here, the more credit card information is out there. So why do we have a lot of credit card information out in uh, documents on the file share or in the production email or SharePoint? Those are immediate specific slices that you can take action on uh, to reduce that cost and risk. So looking, as, uh, looking for a framework to support you doing cleanup, uh, key again is to be able to get a single unified view as shown in the heat map examples earlier. 
where you can look across all of your unstructured information, even down to desktops and laptops where their uncontrolled and information is out there in the wild, and let you investigate, get to the facts of the data, identify relevant content. There will be a small subset that you can leverage or the classification, simplistically train it on your existing retention schedule, give it examples between 15 and 50 examples of each of your record classes or categories, and it can go out and find records in the wild. You can then remediate very quickly. And then having the capability to act at an enterprise scale on those slices and reduce the cost and risk. And all of these capabilities give you a framework to not just do cleanup, but running along the top here of the page to act on all of any of these other use cases or priority actions that you need, whether you need to do cleanup for disposal, whether you need to do dynamic collection for e-discovery, whether you need to meet new uh, privacy mandates, get to do basic retention, put in place archiving route to uh, reduce the consumption of your top tiers of storage, and even help with migration as well. And this, again, especially is key. Dan mentioned uh, it earlier. Uh, too often today, when we're looking to do version upgrades, or migrations of large unstructured data sources in our enterprise, the option is we just need to move all the data or upgrade it all to move it to the new version. Using an assessment and cleanup tool, you can rapidly whittle down that total footprint, and it can be a much smaller, faster, quicker, less risk uh, subset of information that we actually need to migrate or do a version upgrade on, benefiting to everybody. An example was a, uh, a recent uh, Swedish uh, IT company I worked with who had a large volume of information in file shares and in SharePoint. And they were able to uh, significantly reduce uh, their production storage consumption and avoid in that same year having to refresh and expand storage. Uh, they'd be able to discard uh, almost 50% of their information that was either rot or was aged in frequently accessed information that they could re-tier and put in a, a lower, cheaper tier of storage. Being able to do that, they were able to identify and also remediate sensitive and critical information, so reducing their risk and overall limiting the file share growth uh, going forward. So immediate same-year benefits uh, for that organization. Let's walk through another example where we're able to uh, help business and IT come together to be able to clean up especially uh, file shares, most often a place where unstructured consumption, cost and risk is uh, out of control. Uh, this is actual real world business case example uh, that I've been involved with previously. And often organizations who are interested in doing assessment and legacy cleanup first ask, uh, the, the, the story sounds great, but how would we really do this? We want to be able to prove it to ourselves. So we're able to do a rapid business case and live assessment with them on a small subset or sample of the data and show them their actual facts, risks, risks and potential benefits. So uh, one organization here had uh, 750 terabytes of uh, production file share data. Uh, they were able to focus just on the user shares. Uh, often file shares are split up into uh, user shares, your personal share drive that only you have access to. You may be part of a group or a team where you have group file shares that the a team can collaborate on. And often also there's application file shares. The specific structured systems or applications keep semi-structured or unstructured information on. But here we're going to focus just on the user uh, file share uh, folders. Uh, they were consuming 100 terabytes of production data, and they were able to reduce that uh, to 68 by going through uh, rot uh, removal and cleanup, uh, again, very, very quickly in weeks. They were then able to move on in the workflow process and identify what information is infrequently is accessed or aged. Uh, stuff that is uh, rarely, if ever now, uh, accessed. And they were able to move 50% uh, of that infrequently used or accessed data to an archive, still preserving the context to the end users uh, in the where did I put my files in what folders 
that context is still important to me. But we can preserve that and still gain benefits by moving it to a lower, cheaper tier of archive storage. So in the end, they're able to reduce by half uh, the volume of just the user's file shares. And again, helping them avoid having to refresh or expand their unstructured storage footprint and their IT costs in that same year. Key now today is getting to end year, same year benefits. Some other common cleanup use cases and benefits uh, across industries and across geographies uh, is being able to identify compliance issues. So a large energy uh, company was uh, able to remediate and remove 70% uh, of information that was sensitive and critical, private data. Uh, for those uh, involved in the Deepwater Horizon case driven by eDiscovery, instead of uh, massively over-collecting, uh, retaining, and preserving, they were able to know what's in our data, know the facts of our data, and reduce by 100 times the volume of data they collected just for one uh, e-discovery collection for one case alone, which paid out in a saving in one case alone of $2 million and just two weeks to then analyze that data. And then uh, large financial services organizations being able to reduce their storage costs, their information risk, and actually get to do disposal, start to be able to press the delete button by reducing by 30% their uh, uh, unstructured document, file share, SharePoint, and email archiving uh, repositories uh, and being able to remove uh, 300 terabytes of uh, data across their uh, end users' desktops and laptops as well. So our call to action, your cleanup call to action today is to not just focus on the potential rot benefits, but you can very quickly, without uh, compliance or legal approval to identify and remove rot and drain the swamp. But these benefits of assessment and cleanup of unstructured data can also help you in uh, M&A, where you need to define and know what is the key critical information for this line of business that we're about to pass out the door or about to acquire? What are we bringing in? And what's the cost and risk of information? Helping organizations manage their growth and capacity, uh, especially helping IT so they can avoid having to just continue to effectively throw disk at the problem. We can clean up in weeks and months and reduce our storage consumption. And then again, for any not just storage migration, but any uh, system or application version upgrade uh, or migration. We don't need to move or upgrade everything. We can identify, clean up, curate, and end up with a much smaller set that is far faster and of less risk for the organization to migrate with. Back to Teresa. Well, thank you. Uh, we've been listening just now to Richard Hogg of IBM, and before that we were listening to Dan Elam of Contoral. And I'm just going to leave their contact information up on the screen for just a moment here. And just to remind you to um, you download a copy of the slide so not only can you get their contact information, but just have at your fingertips all the great resource and these outlines that they've been sharing with us today, and, and certainly the other resources that are there. We have some links to some great um, white papers and just some online reading. So, um, Please avail yourself to all of that. Um, I, I do want to. We have a lot of really good questions coming in. I'm going to do my best to get to many, as many of these as I can. And uh, I want to direct the first one over to um, to Richard. You, know, you were talking a, a bit about differentiating between archiving versus migrating, and someone specifically asked you know, how to deal with the um, obsolescence of software applications, things like homegrown databases or just those older systems like WordPerfect or previous versions of, of um, Word or Excel. Lotus 1, 2, 3. How do you, uh, yes? Yeah, Lotus uh, is, 1, 2, 3 is another example. Okay. Um, so yeah, how do companies so, deal with that when, when they're archiving off their information? Sure. Uh, so uh, a key factor is to look at and have an element in your information management program, your governance program for long-term digital preservation. We really nowadays should have as part of our retention and information management policies and schedules, not just defining the, the business trigger and the retention period for information, but we should also be defining the 
uh, long-term preservation uh, formats or options that we're going to have. For example, today, if you're storing any um, critical business records in common Microsoft Office formats, you may want to also render them into PDFA as a near-term preservation format. And these assessment and cleanup technologies can let you rapidly get to the facts of your information, what files, what formats are out there, and quickly get them in a list and determine these are the common uh, formats we'll use as a, a normal course of business today. These are a subset that are an older format or even outdated, and take them through a remediation, a, a rendition process to get them into a preserved, reusable format. Good, thank you. And actually, the, there's a lot of information on the AIM website about um, PDFA, PDF Archive. Um, so I know there's a, a lot of additional information available to people out there to, to help them with that. Um, Dan, I have a, a, another question that's come in here. Um, you know, you both gave a lot of good examples of ROT, um, you know, the, the, the redundant, obsolete, trivial information. Um, you know, Richard specifically mentioned things like, you know, music and personal photos and, you know, the emails about lunch plans are, you know, the things that um, I also hear reference a lot. But what about, you know, things like the previous versions of the reference and working documents? Um, it, it, can you talk about, you know, some other kinds of, of ROT or things to just be for people to keep aware of and how that they can incorporate that into their records management planning? Well, I mean, certainly things like version control are an issue for everyone. and There isn't a one-size-fits-all. That's going to be uh, an issue based on the on the business and, and what the legal and regulatory issues are. So for that, you're going to have to refer back to your records retention schedule for the specifics. But, um, you know, a lot of it is context, and that's where it gets tough. You know, if you have an email um, <clears throat> that, you know, like Richard said, you know, if the email is, hey, do you want to get lunch today, and the answer is yes, well, that's not a record. If you have an email that says, do you approve this transaction, and the answer is yes, then that becomes a record. So context is really important for these, and that's why there's not a one-size-fits-all, and that's why some of these advanced tools that can take a look at context or how things are put together can, can play a key role. One of the things that we found is that the tools are actually as accurate or more accurate than, than human beings, just like, you know, 10 years ago when – uh, optical character recognition switch so that uh, that the computers were more accurate on a character basis by the than the individuals than people uh, we've done the same thing for con content now uh, users can still look for additional information and know when to look for additional information but I mean that's a continued continued problem for everybody so but um, so unfortunately there's not a one-size-fits-all on all that stuff you can't just simply say all pictures happen to be vacation pictures that I copied to the hard drive and get rid of those because you know it might very well be pictures of you know something else that has business importance Okay. Um, kind of aligned to that, and, and you also mentioned your uh, your records retention plan. You know, who makes those decisions for determining what is rot or what does how a, a um, and I know this can be a whole webinar into itself. Um, but but just briefly about you know who makes those decisions. Um, well, that's a great question, and the the answer is. Really, it's the it's the organizational or corporate records manager. I mean, they're the one that has responsibility for the records. Now, as a practical matter, almost every records manager has some delegation. You'll have records coordinators, or you'll have you know records officers that are distributed through an organization, and they have further delegation by policy to allow users to delete things that uh, are not records. Um, this is where you get into defensible disposition issues. If you just simply say anybody can delete anything and you haven't trained them and you haven't defined records and you don't have a retention schedule, the courts probably are not going to accept that and you probably will have problems down the road. Certainly, if you're in a regulated environment, um, you'll get nailed to the wall. So, But that's where you sit down and you work with your records manager. But the, the corporate records manager is the one that has you know, typically legal responsibility. And then everyone else that's involved in, in classifying records or deleting information has some responsibility, and they ought to be trained on how to do that. Um, Richard, you know, one of the questions that we have here, you know, because like Dan men mentions you know, with the records management plan, that you know, legal and compliance is involvement in that. Um, you know, 
you know, from what you're seeing with, with the organizations that you work with, for when, organiz, organ, when they're just working on the rot cleanup side of things, if that's already documented well in the planning, do you still need to keep legal and compliance, you know, in that, you know, review and, and, and deletion approval cycles when you're just working with rot? How are you seeing that with your com with your organizations that you work with? Uh, yeah, uh, it does vary. Uh, a good practice would be to you know just do a quick review with legal or compliance. So we've identified the so there isn't a risk to the business, and we're going to go ahead and convey the volume of uh, cost and risk saving it would give. Um, uh, and often these are uh, very quick discussions based on the facts that are you can have, uh, identifying core common examples of rot for the business, that these aren't records or this aren't, this isn't risky information, and be able to deal with the reality that in the business across the unstructured information, there'll be exceptions. For example, we may have a policy of uh, we're not going to have any photographs, they shouldn't be out on the file shares or SharePoint, except for the marketing team who do use media. So you do need to be able to have that enterprise flexibility, and these modern tools give you that. Um, Dan, one of the things that you had mentioned um, in your part of the presentation was that you know good records management practices is cost effective, um, and, and and certainly you, from both of you, we've heard a lot of really good information and and outlines on on how to get started and how to get moving in with a you know mapping, organizing, and migrating the information. Um, but how do the people on the call here today work to get either the attention of their senior executives or their, their fellow team members um, to, to start implementing these plans or have more developed plans from what they may already have in their organization? Um, how, how do we work to get these initiatives moving in organizations? Sure. It's really not any different from other IT programs or other uh, major initiatives. You need a business case and typically with a justification. Now. A lot of organizations look at records management as a as a, just a requirement or an expense, and that's a short-sighted view of what good records management can do. And being able to articulate to senior management that records management is going to save um, uh, this much money in terms of uh, user productivity, this much money in terms of uh, IT costs by reducing the amount of information that we have to, to manage and store and back up. Uh, it's going to save this much money in terms of uh, legal costs for when you do your, your e-discovery request, your internal collection, your, your production with the vendors. Um, and then last but not least, um, what the impact is in terms of, of um, you know, the, the legal and regulatory issues. You know, for example, we have financial models that show when a financial services firm is accused of fraud, you know, typically, you know, getting rid of information or something like that that they shouldn't, that there's an impact on their, their stock price. And, you know, that's very real money that comes out of the shareholders and is, a, you know, a legitimate reason to, to spend money. So so these models can be fairly sophisticated, but but basically you've got to make the case to senior management. And in many cases, is senior management don't truly understand where the opportunities are for records management, and so they welcome the additional uh, scrutiny for a return on investment model. And Richard, how are you seeing your, your customers and uh, the companies you work with handle this issue? Sure. Uh, thank you. It's often driven by one or more of the, the use cases I showed in the big picture earlier, whether it's uh, IT realizes that storage growth is out of control. They can't afford to throw more disk at the problem. We need to clean stuff up, folks. Help us with that. Or it may be the lack of meeting regulatory compliance or any new privacy uh, mandate or just uh, to be, we can't find the right information. We know it's out there, but the volume is diluting our ability to find it to regulatory or auditor investigation timelines. Uh, key is, again, to focus on the getting the facts of the data and deriving any business case and forecast of uh, potential saving cost and risk on those facts of the data. That will then get the C-level, the decision makers, uh, attention and buy-in. No, no more guesses, assumptions, or industry averages, but the facts of your information. And these assessment tools, enterprise scales today, will give you those very quickly. Um, someone's asking a question here. Uh, they're newer to the records management profession. Um, 
basically they're coming out about with calculating ROI and calculating, calculating savings. Um, some tips on, on how to make those calculations or resources to turn to to, to help them um, discover that, that kind of savings or this, make those calculations. Um, Dan, some thoughts there? Well, Richard's absolutely right. You can't use just the generic numbers. I mean, you'll have lots of vendors that throw out, you know, uh, uh, a one-size-fits-all number for, for something, and that just never works in the real world. So um, <clears throat> there are resources uh, out there. There are certain – AIM has done various uh, white papers and other things over the years around return on investment. The Contouro website has a whole bunch of information on, on ROI for these type of situations, especially for defensible disposition. But the bottom line is you start with those seven content types and you model them all the way through the, the storing of the information, the creating of the information, and then the, the e-discovery process um, and, and apply cost to them. So, um, I mean, typically what we're finding is that these programs have payback periods in less than two years. The problem is that most organizations don't know how to properly classify and take a look at the uh, at the benefits that good records management can bring. Um, I know we're getting to the end of our webinar hour, but I want to squeeze in one more question here. Um, someone's asking about the um, the information custodians uh, and the owners uh, the owners of the and the people responsible for the information. Um, are these the people that you know agree about how to manage the information rather than the records managers? What's a little bit? Yeah, I, uh, yeah go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I'm very passionate about this. They're obviously a key stakeholder. You know, it's their information. They should know what's in it and the value. Uh, but often they don't know what's in all their information. So again, using the assessment tool to give them the facts of their information can streamline and focus give you a laser focus on that negotiation. Today, if you go to the, uh, the custodians or the line of business and say, you've got this file share, it's consuming 50 terabytes of information, uh, how much should of, the, of that do we keep? Uh, how, much is it, how much of that is, it, is useful to you? They'll give you generic answers like, we need to keep it all, or we need to keep it for seven years. Again, we want to focus on the facts information. You've got 15 years of information here consuming X terabytes. You only ever access the last five years. What if we archived after five years? And let's look at what actually your records or sensitive information and rot and clean up in that five year we do leave online and also around the table with the line of business, with records, with privacy. Make sure everyone knows uh, the information categories and classes and what the corporate guidance is for where and how long to keep that stuff. Great information. Thank you. Um, just wanted to let everybody know, uh, if you haven't heard already, coming up in New Orleans and uh, just at the end of April, um, AIM's annual conference is coming up. We do have some great uh, keynote speakers lined up, certainly a lot of great um, panelists and round, a lot of roundtable discussions this year. I was just looking at the agenda yesterday. So there's going to be a lot of really uh, good interactivity and, and good collaboration with your peers. So go to the AIM conference website and get some more information about joining us at the annual conference. Um, just also want to let you know, remind you that we have, have been recording this webinar and it will be available in a day or two. And uh, certainly we'll be emailing everyone who registered for this webinar um, the link to that replay so that you'll be able to catch this webinar again and also to invite your colleagues to listen to it because there's just been a wealth of really good information being shared today. Uh, I uh, just also want to uh, remind you all, don't forget to download the resources that's in the, the right side of your window. And also when the webinar is over, a uh, brief survey is going to open up on your desktop. Um, and I, I greatly value your feedback and, and really do want to hear from you. Um, so in the survey, you can also comment or uh, suggest future topics for us together. So appreciate if you would take a few moments and offer your feedback on that. Uh, very much want to thank the underwriter of our webinar, IBM. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to provide you with these free educational programs. So thank you, IBM, for your support and sponsorship. Um, and just as we bring this webinar to a close, I do want to leave you with our speaker's closing thoughts or, or a key takeaway from everything we've been discussing today. So I'd like to start first with uh, Richard Hogg of IBM, your closing thoughts today. Thank you. So today you can clean up your data. You can do it in the same year. There are enterprise scale tools 
to accelerate your ability to get to the facts of information and uh, hone those decisions around the stakeholder community to be able to clean up, address your sensitive and critical information, remediate your records in the wild, and get to information that's of value to the business, reducing your cost and your risk. Thank you, Richard. Dan Elam of Contoral, your closing thoughts today. Okay, from my perspective, I think the key thing is make sure that you have a plan. Know how you're going to take a look at your information. Know what you're going to do with it so that you can reduce those migration costs and so that you can keep those costs down for the future. And that's where uh, these various tools will help. The tools are only part of it, though. You still need a plan to do all of that. So good luck. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today. For AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you on our next webinar. Have a good day.